This is Saving the Game, a Christian podcast about tabletop role-playing and collaborative storytelling. Recorded Thursday, December 27th of 2018, it's episode 144. In this episode, hacking published gaming material for use in your own games and settings, plus the Kickstarters we wish we'd backed, a Christmas rundown, the Link to the Past holiday randomizer, our forthcoming actual play series with City on a Hill Gaming, and more. Welcome to Saving the Game, I'm Grant. And I'm Peter. And we don't have a Jenny today because she is traveling uh, with her family for Christmas, and we wish her the best because we know who she's going to see, and it should be awesome. You know, they're all nice people, so we would wish them the best anyways. Man, it's just you and me again. Yeah, we're back to just the founding host for an episode, so... <laughs> Gee, Grant, we haven't done this for a while. What are we going to do? <laughs> I don't know. It's been a day. This, the same thing we did for a couple of years, probably. Uh, yeah, yeah. You told me about that a little bit. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> yeah. Instead of having like this cool board gaming outing to talk about, you know, on the podcast, I got to take my car to the shop. Hooray. Merry Ooh, Christmas to me. Yeah. So, hooray. <laughs> Seasons greetings, you have car troubles. Yeah, uh, well, it's inevitable. It's a old <laughs> and decrepit car. So. Yeah. Old car's gonna old car. Indeed. But you know what? I've had a good Christmas. How about you? Yeah, mine was pretty good, too. Unlike you, I don't really have a lot of gifts to talk about. I got a little bit of clothing, and most of the rest of it was kind of um, gift cards and cash and, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. So I, I have socks and a new, like, fleece jacket thing, which are all comfortable and wonderful, but don't make for interesting conversation. You, on the other hand, got some awesome stuff. I did. I got socks, too, and they are super comfy. I'm looking forward to wearing them after this, because my the socks I'm currently wearing are a little thin. I'd like, <laughs> yeah. some, I'd like some really good, thick socks. My mother-in-law got me this really nice pair of like warm hiking socks. Mm, perfect. Oh, those things are great, especially if they've got the arch supports and stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it turns out once you hit adulthood... Like, your excitement about getting socks it becomes significantly more genuine and much greater in volume. <laughs> That's true. But here's the thing. If you get, like, good colorful socks for the six and under crowd, I can say for certain they're super interested in that as well. Yeah, it's probably like the 8 to 17 crowd that really aren't all about the socks. Like 8 to 20, yeah, probably. Courtesy of you and my wife and my mother-in-law, who's one of those people who just buys people gifts like crazy. Uh, I got some really good gifts this year that were pretty nice. You were kind enough to send me a copy of Xanathar's Guide to Everything, which is a D&D book that's got a lot of, well, it's kind of a little bit of everything. It's got some GM stuff. It's got some player stuff. Really handy little book. I'm looking forward to a lot of the, using a lot of the GM stuff because it is advice on running certain kinds of sessions or encounters, lots of different rules for different things, and then a bunch of like common magic items, which are really good for Eberron. Yeah, and I figured you and Chrissy could use it for character creation and stuff the next time you make some new PCs. So Absolutely. It's... That'll be fun. Aside from that, I got a copy of The Fantasy Makers on DVD. Oh, it's so good. Have you gotten a chance to watch it yet? No, I have not. Um, <laughs> we Our DVD player in our bedroom is our old Xbox 360. Okay. And uh, that's been a Skyrim machine the past few days. Ah, because okay. <laughs> we finally we just put it in there. And... Chrissy's been like, oh, I can play Skyrim. Grant's home to watch the kids. I I can just sit and play Skyrim and enjoy myself and not parent for up to an hour at a time. <laughs> and she's just been doing that. And it's been great. And then I got the bug because Skyrim is a very addictive game. I was like, oh, I'll, I'll play if you're not. So it's kind of been a Skyrim machine. So we haven't watched it yet. I will say this. I got the Fantasy Makers like... Right when it came out, I actually pre-ordered it, so it showed up on release day. Watched it, like, within 10 minutes of yanking it out of the packaging, and left my copy with my parents for them to watch over Christmas. So it's really, really good. Um, our friend Derek White is in there. Yes, uh, he is. Several times, actually. He features rather prominently, so good, good, good. that's kind of cool. But it's just, it's this beautiful, like, fascinating, uplifting like, you don't usually watch a documentary and just kind of walk away feeling warm and good inside, but you absolutely will after watching The Fantasy Makers. I cannot recommend it enough. Awesome. I'm very much looking forward to it. I'm going to find time to watch it here while I'm on break. So I got that. Uh, I got a reading lamp, 
which is good. I, we rearranged the the room that I record in, and we have all our books in. It's our library. Um, we got rid of some excess furniture that we had, so I now have kind of a reading space created, and now it's got a lamp that goes behind it, which is nice. Chrissy basically got me a uh, low-end gaming keyboard, which is nice. Uh, she basically said, here's some money, get yourself a keyboard, because you need a keyboard. Cool. It's It's not... One of the ones with mechanical switches, it's, you know, membrane, but it's got something in there to give it a little bit of feedback and a little bit of sound, so it kind of feels slightly mechanical. Well, if Chrissy is anything like my wife, that's probably a blessing in disguise, honestly. I had a couple of mechanical keyboards and Nikki almost stabbed me, so, yeah. like, <laughs> uh, especially since I like to do a lot of writing and typing and stuff, it's like I'd be sitting there, you know, tap, 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 and she'd be like, I can hear that three rooms away. Yeah. Well, the way our house is structured, uh, because it's an old house, we have plaster and lath uh, walls rather than drywall. So it does a nice job of sound muffling. It does, uh, which is, you know, in a house with two small children, not always the greatest thing you want. <laughs> it's like, But not always the worst Not either, always probably. the worst either, yeah. Uh, so it wouldn't have been too bad, but they're also really expensive. So I got a low-end one. Honestly, it has enough key ghosting for me to play games I want to play. And it, I went ahead and got one that has the um, individual backlights on each nice. key, and it's just fun. The kids love it. You know, my six-year-old loves playing Minecraft and then hits a key and color ripples across the keyboard. She has fun with that. So Cool. Yeah. The one that's really dearest to me, honestly, is a copy of Ursula K. Le Guin's Earthsea books. It's the, the Barnes & Noble edition, I think it is. The complete illustrated edition with... All the novels and all the short stories. Oh, wow. It's a single tome. It's about 978 pages. It's got a bunch of illustrations by Charles Vest that look incredible. They're these beautiful pen and ink drawings that just pop. They're so good. I love it. Considering that you just got me to read A Wizard of Earthsea recently yeah i can i can definitely see the appeal of that one i suspect it will not take me six years to get you to read tombs of atuan no probably not i will probably do that on my own at some point in the near future <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then the farthest shore and then you know the others because they're really good yeah i may actually go out and snag a copy of the book that you just got just so i've got everything collected in one place or some other collected version of that's probably smart because finding the short stories can be a little tricky just because they're all over the place and it's not like they're in public domain or anything. So right. you can't just get them online. So getting that would be really good. And I mean, it looks fantastic on the shelf. It really does. Yeah. The interesting thing for me is as much as I love Wizard of Mercy, I feel like the series might peak in book three. Hmm. Like, just in terms of quality. And that's saying a lot, because Earthsea's, you know, Wizard of Earthsea is really good. Yeah. But I feel like the second and third books are a little bit better. And then after that, I haven't read them as much, just because I didn't have them. So I can't say, like, I, I can't judge them exactly. I don't think they are quite up there, but they're still really worth reading. It's like saying, well, I mean, this is only pure silver instead of gold. I don't know, guys. So... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one of these is platinum, I, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I found I liked Le Guin's writing style a lot, but I also liked her characters and the fact that she didn't overly rely on violence to move her plot forward. There's very little. Yeah, there's, there's almost none for large chunks of the book. I mean, and when, when there is, it's kind of, it's treated with the kind of seriousness that ordinary people tend to treat it with like yeah because characters they they see a fight coming they see danger coming and they run or you know they grapple and then something happens and you know it's really a, a man wrestling with death right yeah it's kind of the the point of the story and so violence against other people doesn't feature into it except in like the very first part of the book when you know there's the invasion while uh, Ged's a little kid. Yeah, that that was a really interesting thing, too, because it's like, I don't think I've ever seen fog used, or magical fog used that effectively in a story, and I thought that was pretty neat. Yeah. She does a good job of creating a fantasy world that feels like a fantasy world while having very, very few fantasy tropes that are strictly clung to, you know? Yeah. So, 
It's very good. Yeah, it's it's one of the classic works of fantasy for a reason. And oh, I have gotten a chance to discover that recently. So that was pretty cool. I'm glad you did. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> Speaking of classic works, we need to talk about some actual plays. Yes, we do. So our friends over at the MinMax podcast and our friends over at the Inroads podcast are doing an actual play together. And it sounds awesome. I haven't had a chance to listen to the first episode yet, but I am stoked to do so. It sounds like it's um, it's only one person from Inroads. Jeff Romo is the GM and then the MinMax folks are the player character. Okay. I, th- I think maybe this sprang out of that um, last Dean demo where Jeff Romo kind of um, ruined the ongoing storyline for anybody to follow him. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so this this might this is, you know, quite possibly, although I have no idea, but it, this this may be an actual play by way of payback for doing that. I have no idea. No idea. It, it, it amuses me to think so. It's my headcanon, regardless of the truth. And I respect your headcanon, Peter. I respect it. <laughs> At any rate, yeah, they're doing an AP called The Glass Dagger. You can find it on the Min Max and Inroads podcast feeds. I will, of course, link one or both of those in the show notes, probably both just to give, you know, equal time to both of them. Yeah. And alongside that, we are doing an actual play with City on the Hill Gaming uh, starting in February. So by the time you hear this, February is going to be fairly close, honestly. And uh, oh, oh, goodness, I need, to, I need to start thinking about that. I need to start thinking about my Eberron game. Uh, I believe we have all streamed character creation for that yes. game at this point. We've got those videos saved even if they're not posted, yes? Yeah. Yeah, we do. We should probably get those up before the game actually starts so people can see that. Uh, yeah, one of, one of us will work on it. Getting our YouTube channel caught up is one of my goals for 2019. One, uh, first quarter 2019, I should say. There's a non-trivial amount of labor involved in that from what I understand, though. Yes, so. there is. So we'll see what we can do. But it's a thing we have, and um, we have those there. We just need to get them up. Yep. Speaking of, I got to say... I really enjoyed streaming the holiday link to the past randomizer. Oh yeah, that was that was fun. That's something else we should get up because that was that was cool. A lot of people were off for Christmas and stuff, so we didn't have a huge audience. But that was really neat. They added a lot of cool little seasonal like bits to the music and the artwork, and it was just it was a neat thing to watch you do. It was, and you know, I appreciate that it wasn't all just pop Christmas songs. Like there were some traditional carols and hymns that were mixed in plus peanuts christmas theme you know it was just it's a great mix yeah and the, like the the wandering around the map music was here comes santa claus which was kind of funny it's a fun mix of different stuff i think um the boss fight music if i remember correctly was uh nutcracker theme like the do 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 sounds right do 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 i should remember what that is i've been to the nutcracker often enough my mother is a ballet teacher <laughs> I, it's escaping me now, but yeah, like it was just a lot of fun and they did some goofy stuff and we got about halfway through the game in two and a half, three hours, uh, about two and a half hours. And I feel reasonably good about that, given that I died a bunch and am not great at the game because I'm very unpracticed. So it was good. Uh, and the funny thing is you in the chat kept commenting on things you were going to borrow from the game. I did. Yeah. And that was... Okay, so that actually is probably going to feed into our main topic because... It is, which is why I wanted to call it out. So we're going to be talking tonight about uh, hacking published adventures, but for whatever reason, my gamer goggles were just like squarely over my eyes as I was watching that, and I was like, oh, rooms that expand. Hmm. You know, and just, I, I had a lot of things that I saw in just kind of the encounter, because I'd never played or seen Link to the Past, really. I, I... I didn't grow up with consoles. I've been PC exclusive for my entire life, except for a very brief interval of having a first gen PlayStation, like in my early 20s. So I can't say that you have still ever seen Link to the Past, frankly. But I'm sure that same kind of like encounter design existed. Well, yeah, of course. I mean, the, the mechanics of the game have not changed. I'm just saying, you know, making a joke because it was a holiday ROM hack. Watching watching that, it was kind of like, oh, that's interesting. Are these floor tiles that pop off the floor and come, you know, after you as flying enemies? That's interesting. And so, like, I'm looking at this old game that I hadn't had any experience with, and it's like, huh. Mm. That, well, that's the thing. The dungeon design 
in A Link to the Past is really, really good. And it set a lot of standards very, very high for the rest of the Zelda series going forward and a lot of other games. Yeah. It's really good. If you want to uh, see something crazy that also will get your gamer brain thinking, there's a randomizer that crosses both A Link to the Past and Super Metroid. Yeah, you've told me about this. Because there's 100 items in Super Metroid and like 250 items total in A Link to the Past, and they just mix and match all of them. And it gets absolutely insane. It's really crazy. But there's a bunch of really good level design in Super Metroid. Now, because it's a side scroller or, you know, side view action platformer, I don't know that it's as tabletop relevant, but there's still some cool stuff. Oh, I've definitely gotten some stuff out of side scrolling games before. Yeah, there you go. Anyway, let's hold this thought for a moment, do our Patreon question and our scripture, and then let's come back to the idea of borrowing from other published material. Yeah. All right, let me roll a die here. Uh, before I do, though, I want to remind all of our patrons as we start the new year that we, uh, all of our patrons, we need Patreon questions from you. We've only got six people with questions on the list right now, and we've got 20 Patreon supporters. So please step up and, you know, send us questions. You can email them to us, hosts at stgcast.org. You can send them through Patreon messages. You can... Discord? You, know, you can even... <laughs> Yeah, you can send Discord. I'd rather have them... And something a little less ephemeral. Yeah, exactly. One of those would really be ideal, but anything you can do to get us questions would be really appreciated. Everybody who is a Patreon supporter should have a link to the big questions table that we sent them when they joined. If you don't have that, reach out to us. Let me know. I'll I'll get that to you. You can look at that, see both past questions and questions currently in the backlog. So if you want to make your stuff different, feel free. As a reminder, we don't care what kind of questions they are as long as they aren't, you know, actively crude. If you want to ask us about cars, I mean, you're not going to get a lot, but you can ask us. You're going to get a lot of angry fist shaking at this point because we both had expensive yeah, right car, or, uh, car repairs lately. But hey, go for it. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. You know, if you want to if you want to ask questions about lawn care, I'll, I'll do what I can. <laughs> you know, whatever. I don't here's, care. Here's an example. Like this time of year, stuff that's not, you know, directly faith or gaming related. What's your favorite type of Christmas cookie? What's your yeah. favorite Christmas carol? That sort of thing is totally valid. We like Digging into the more analysis-heavy questions, uh, as you can probably hear on dozens of previous episodes, but you don't have to hit us with a heavy one every time. So yeah, exactly. Let's roll this die. Alrighty. Okay, this is from Kevin Von Felt. What Kickstarter do you wish you'd backed but didn't? Oh, I can tell you mine right now. Right. This came up in the last episode. It's the Rain Kickstarter. Ah, uh, okay. Because it was um, not just a new edition of Rain, but like two premium books, like, you know, nice leather, gilt cover, the whole, the works, right? Would have been really, really good, and I didn't get on it. I can give you one that I wish I'd had the resources to back at a much higher level. I I did back this. Money Cook Games, the people behind the Cypher system, uh... Numenera and so forth did Kickstarter for an upcoming product called Your Best Game Ever, which is like this book of gaming advice, which those who pay attention to like the stuff that I post in our Discord and talk about here on the podcast and stuff know that I kind of like books of gaming advice in general. Mm -hmm. But the stretch goals for that thing were insane. If I had had another $250 lying around, I would have thrown it at them immediately because there's like multiple campaign settings and like all of this other like quality of life stuff. And it's just like, oh, this looks so cool. I just can't afford it. So that's probably my answer. <laughs> I backed at a level where I'm not going to be getting a lot of the stuff that looked the most interesting to me because I just didn't have it at the time. Well, that's the thing. I didn't have it for rain either, but I wish I'd gotten. And I'm not a PDF person, by and large. If I'm going to, I absolutely value PDFs as a resource for people. I'm totally behind them, like existing. I'm not a purist about it or anything. 
I just, when I sit down to read a game for the first time, I really need it in physical form. And if it's a game I like, I want it in physical form. And I really loved Rain First Edition. So I could have backed Rain at like a dirt cheap tier and gotten just the PDFs, but I would have been really unhappy with myself. See, I, I'm i perfectly fine doing just PDF tiers of stuff because I've got a nice 10-inch color tablet that's pretty good to read gaming books on. Okay, so see, it's not a reading thing necessarily. Like, it's not... I don't understand it. It's a physical, like, I want to sit down with a book. Thing. You want to feel the, the paper yeah. and, you know, smell the ink and that sort of thing? Yeah, I don't have trouble parsing the rules if it's on a PDF, right? That's that's not the case. I know one of the, I knew that about you when I started saying this. I, I just know a lot of people seem to, like, if you don't have a tablet, then you're stuck reading stuff either on your phone, which is tiny, Oh, yeah, don't do that. Or on a computer screen, which is not always the best reading experience. Like, it's great for, like, encounter design if you can pull a PDF with your monsters and stuff up on one monitor and then be working on, you know, other stuff on another if you've got a multi-monitor set up like both of us do. But, yeah, no, like, I, I get the I get the tactile element for sure. I mean, <laughs> I worked for, you know, in the book business for over 15 years between two jobs, so. Let me throw something out for okay. you. And this is branching off from the question a bit, but here's just a thought. What would you think about gaming books released without art as EPUB books? Where it can then be formatted for like a phone or another tablet that's not a nice reading tablet or something like that. I would probably want the version with the art too, but I might make some use out of those. Um, as long as the layout was good and the, you know, like the headers and tables and, you know, the organization yeah, didn't yeah. suffer. Assuming it's well formatted, yeah. you know, all that, right? Assuming it's not just, uh, we grabbed the text, we did control shift V to paste it in and uh, whatever. Yeah. Right. Assuming that there's some actual effort put into it because I've been reading some books on my phone, uh, through Google books, you know, the Google play books thing. And my phone's got uh, a thing where at night it changes the color of the screen so it's not that bright white. It kind of goes orangey. Okay. And I find it's really comfortable to read on my phone. So if I had a gaming book that I could just kind of read through like that, it'd be really nice assuming it was well formatted because I've got some books that are not properly formatted. They're kind of just like images of pages and that's a real pain. And PDFs kind of work like that, but an actual EPUB that's formatted for it Feels really good. I read the original Lazy Dungeon Master book that way. I have an e-reader around here that I got cheap from work. My The company I work for sells used IT equipment, but we got one of those and it's like, yeah, no, nobody's going to sell this. Do you want to buy it? Here, have it for a pittance. So I, I actually threw the original Lazy Dungeon Master and Hamlet's Hit Points on there, I believe, and read through both of them that way. And those were fine. I, I think for something like a book of monsters or something, I would really miss the artwork because a lot of the time the artwork is kind of the first thing that catches your eye. But for like the meta advice books and stuff, yeah, pfft, I don't care. Give me the give me the text format it nicely so that it, you know, I can I can parse it in the way that it was intended to be parsed. And yeah, yeah, that would be kind of cool. OK, cool. Well, Kevin, thank you for your question. Really appreciate it. And again, if you want to send a question in, all you have to do is back us on Patreon for a dollar or more. Patreon.com slash saving the game helps us out. And once again, uh, existing patrons and new patrons, please make sure to send us questions. We really want those. <laughs> all right, let's read some scripture real quick. And then we've got a surprisingly long topic for something we kind of just came up with on the fly as a, oh, 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 Lord, it's Christmas. We need to, <laughs> we need to record kind of topic. So let's get That's this done. Mad um, Outlander strike again. Uh, I'll take Proverbs. You want to take Colossians? Sure. All right. Uh, this is Proverbs twenty two twenty nine. Do you see someone skilled in their work? They will serve before kings. They will not serve before officials of low rank. And we have Colossians chapter three, verses 23 to 24, words that still resonate despite us having used them in a few other episodes as well. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So we're talking about hacking published adventures, as we said at the top of the show. Published adventures are a bit of a controversial topic in the role-playing game community, I would say. 
There are people who hate them and think you should never use them. There are people, believe it or not, who think you should only use published adventures. Or like you're not allowed to use stuff that you come up with on your own, you know. Oh, you're you're not qualified. Well, you know, it's not even that. I- oh, I've heard that opinion. <laughs> well, okay, fair. My brother-in-law had was trying to get a, an online game going. He was like, yeah, you know, I want to run this, you know, the setting that I've created. And the guy literally just rolled his eyes over the, the hangout that he was talking to and just went, ugh, homebrew. So, yeah, these people do exist, yeah. believe it or not. I know they're not super po- common among, like, our listeners, but, yeah, they're out there. You're out there. We We see you. <laughs> We see you rolling your eyes and treating people with scorn. (laughs) Yeah. Now, I think Jenny is more on the anti-module side of things. I kind of am, too. I actually am, too, but it's for a different reason than the two of you. Yeah. I have never really used them, is the thing. Uh, So I don't want to say I'm anti-module. I just... The games I want to play aren't module games, if that makes sense. Okay, so so real quick here, just Jenny is on the record as saying that she finds them kind of confining, which I think is a legitimate complaint. She she said that when she was running us through Overlight, actually, when we discussed that on the episode. For me, it's a confidence thing. It's also the reason why I never use published settings, is I feel like... I'm not going to I'm going to forget something and not do justice to something and like paint myself into some kind of a corner or something. So I will use them for inspiration. Also, I have to say, like in most cases, I really don't enjoy reading adventures all that much in, you know, just like straight through. I I find crunch and setting information and stuff to be much more readable than pre-written adventures for some reason. Sure. Well, that makes sense. So given that we're not the biggest fans of just sitting down and running modules. What do we do with modules? Because they are there and they are a resource. Yeah. So, right. I mean, the obvious answer is if you're comfortable with them, running them as written is totally valid. Right. And I want to make that clear because we're going to be talking about hacking these apart. I want to make it clear. Playing modules is totally fine. And if you're having fun, please have fun. Yeah. There's there's all of this really like well-written stuff out there. That's that's been played by zillions of people and they've all had a blast and it's really well regarded The the Kingmaker um, adventure path for Pathfinder, the rise of the Rune Lords path for them, the masks of near Lothotep for Call of Cthulhu, Dracula dossier, yeah, Dracula dossier, Blue Medusa mega dungeon that came out recently. Yeah. I Strahd, you know, there's there's all of this like venerable, super well regarded classic adventures that thousands of gaming groups have gone through and just had the time of their life. And if if you feel like, you know, you want to do that with your gaming group and, you know, they're on board, go for it. We are not going to look down on you for that. And I will also say some of these classic modules are worth going through in for the same reason that a classic book is worth reading, Absolutely. even though it's not written the same way that a modern author would write things and may not even be quite as good in some ways. Because it is a classic of the genre, you still enjoy it as that. Mm-hmm. It's okay to say, this is a classic of my hobby, even if we have advanced in mod- in adventure design and story design over the past 30 years. Let's give it a try and see where we started. Yeah, I mean, White Plume Mountain is still considered a, a classic because it's a zany funhouse dungeon that lots of people love it's total nonsense (laughs) but it's fun nonsense and that's the thing given all that why do we want to hack them because we've got them and we've got some good reason whether it's familiarity or there it's not that great or it's the wrong system or you're just not comfortable for one of those reasons to run it straight but there's all this stuff in there, you know, it's like right. a printed adventure or a published, you know, a PDF of a published adventure or something is really nothing more and nothing less than a collection of somebody else's creative effort. And that's very cool. It's like there, there's a lot that you can take out of there. Let's get started. What would you what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about published adventures and what you want to steal from them. The first thing, given that it is a module for the game I'm running or like a previous edition or a related game is a combat encounter. Sure. Because combat encounters are sometimes tedious to plan. They take a lot of time doing math 
And they're difficult to get right in a system that's assuming certain kinds of balance. So having a few prepackaged encounters ready is very helpful. If you can just, you know, take them, take one off the shelf, tweak it to suit what you have coming up and then say, all right, here we go. Great. Cool. In systems like D&D, where resource management is part of what makes a dungeon crawl difficult and interesting, right? You know, I got to meter out my spells because I only got so many until we get to rest and we're not going to have a chance to rest here anytime soon. The nice thing about a adventure or a module is that it has that series planned out. Right. Right. It's not just, oh, I can borrow this map, this set of stats. I can kind of borrow the whole chain and see what the balance is like over the course of multiple encounters so I can give my players a sense that they do have to ration their supplies, even though, you know, it's probably going to be fine. Yeah. But you you want to stretch that out. That's one of the things I really struggle with. And part of it is because the colony game I was running was not well suited for multiple sequential encounters. Yeah, I mean, when you're out in unsettled jungle and stuff, it's kind of, eh, <laughs> it's a little... Yeah, what am I going to do? Throw wildlife at you over and over? Yeah. Kind of gets tedious, yeah. right? And most of the time, wildlife isn't that hostile, naturally, either, so... Well, right. And D&D wildlife, sure, I can make it hostile, whatever, but... Unless I have created a dungeon and sent you into it, you're not going to have that. Borrowing that stuff is really, really handy. Likewise, maps, right? Maps are really tough. Uh, and I'm specifically talking about combat encounter maps. Because create, creating creative combat terrain and imagining stuff is difficult. But when you do it, it's really fun for your players. Players love having an interactive environment to to explore and play off of. Yeah, and actually a good map, even just looking at it without any of the context that it was created in, right? You just get a, a nice map and you look at it and the wheels start turning. We we both subscribe to some subreddits where people just post up combat maps that they've made just for anybody to use. The R Battle Maps subreddit. And one of those that I saw a while ago that I haven't had a chance to use yet, but I really want to is there's a section of river with... Something that's halfway between a bridge and a fort across it. It's just like all of these interlocking ramps going back and forth and different platforms and stuff. And it's it's supposed to be kind of like a bandit fortification. There's a couple of like ballistas at different spots, like pointing out into the surrounding environment and stuff. It's like, that looks really cool. That looks like something out of a movie. I have got to use this at some point. I have no idea when or where, but it's like. You know, you see something neat like that and, you know, the wheels start turning or like a forest with these giant magical crystals growing out of the ground, which was another one. Or that that bridge that you guys had the fight on the last time we had a session and you guys had that combat encounter against that group of people from Alcova. That started out as, oh, hey, I've got this map. Right. Yeah. That, that, those are great because, as you say, you can expand those very easily. And they're probably some of the easiest things to steal because you wipe the labels off and, hey, that bridge can be anywhere. Yeah. Right. Now, obviously, combat encounters need to be tweaked for your own game. That's true of all of these, really. But combat encounters specifically, because if you don't change at least the skin of what you're fighting, it's going to seem very strange. It's like, I, I thought we were up against elves. Why are we suddenly fighting orcs in the elf tower? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was lazy. I mean, come on, change it, right? If if it's a snowy place, make it a, a snow map. Make these obvious changes, yeah. right? But that it makes it a lot less work to just borrow these. Indeed. Also, this is something that I struggle with sometimes, but borrowing rewards out of adventures can be really interesting. I'm specifically kind of talking about loot heavy games like Dungeons and Dragons where part of the the fun is exploring and finding stuff yeah. that then fuels the next adventure, right? Yeah. I've been playing a lot of Skyrim, like I said, it's much the same. But what's interesting is module writers tend to be a lot more creative than the folks who wrote the like the original Dungeon Master's Guide or whatever, because all the really interesting stuff from the DMG comes from old adventures from the early days of, of D&D. And the other thing that you got to remember, the core books have to be generic. They do. Absolutely. So when somebody writes a module and they're like, hey, here's this cool bit of uh, reward, right? Because it fits the place that you're coming from and it does this special thing and Oh, and uh, your other reward is this guy owes you a favor and you have access to, um, you know, such and such crossing. Cool, right? All of these are neat things that you get to do. 
those are things to borrow. Borrow heavily. Those are great. Yeah, take inspiration, if nothing else. Right. And that, of course, leads us to non-player characters. Yep. A lot of the time, because they're trying to distinguish themselves from all of the other published adventurers out there, adventurer writers will be on their A-game when it comes to NPC design. We hope, we hope they will. Yeah. Or they, they at least try and be. There's a particular example, this, this uh, cyberpunk hitman named Abamadeus Killafree, which is a great name, from one of the old GURP cyberpunk adventures that I still remember to this day, despite probably not having cracked that book in at least six or seven years. Abamadeus Killafree is this gigantic titan of a person in a duster coat with those round lensed sunglasses. It's like, okay, yeah, uh, every 90s bad guy ever. Stay with me. He's got these weird cyber eyes that are like just mirrored globes underneath. He's got this high-pitched squeaky voice, so he almost never talks because it detracts from his menacing appearance. And he doesn't carry external weaponry. He has this gyrock launcher mounted in one of his arms. So he just kind of like points his hand at his target and shoots them that way. None of this is entirely unique, of course, but it's all been assembled into kind of this neat hole and it's a cool concept you don't have to think of all of that stuff on your own and it hangs together relatively neat the other thing that's cool is unlike a lot of professional criminals he doesn't come from a disadvantaged background he's a wealthy guy who's bored and he decided to take up like a life of crime because of that which adds kind of an additional terrifying sociopathic dimension to him but Sure. It's cool. It works. And honestly, the name, Abamadeus Killifrey, is a great name. And if somebody hasn't played GURPS or, you know, read GURPS Cyberpunk, they may not know that name, probably won't. And you'll sound amazing for just whipping that out at the table and be like, yeah, that's what his name is. And everyone will be like, yeah, what? That's a great name. Steal names. Go crazy. Yeah. Um. Scrape, if you're not going to run an adventure, especially if it's not in the system that you're playing, mm -hmm. yeah. scrape any interesting names out of there, throw them in a table and mix and match them until you've got stuff that you like. Sure. Coming up with good names for RPG characters is one of the great GM headaches of all time. So don't do it. Just borrow somebody else's. Yeah. Now, obviously, there are iconic NPC names that people who've been in the hobby for a while just kind of know, even if they've not played the adventure. Yeah, Strahd, Vecna, Sirarak. Right. You know, all classics. Even then, if you're crossing genres especially, steal those names. It'd be fun. It can be kind of hilarious. Imagine I'm running a Shadowrun game for you, and then it's like, yeah, you do find a Decker who offers to get you the information for, you know, 10,000 New Yen. Uh, he goes by the handle of Sirarak. And everybody's like, oh, I get that reference. Right, yeah. Steal it, have fun. There are not just individual NPCs, but NPC organizations. Go crazy with those. You know, I've been doing a bunch of Eberron stuff lately. I'm going to be borrowing a lot of Cults of the Dragon Below from various different free RPG day adventures and that sort of thing, because those are really handy to just have. Yeah, the, the other trick here is similar but not identical settings. A lot of the time you don't have to do an enormous amount of effort to port things from one to another. So true. For instance, in Eberron... You can almost just grab stuff out of Ravnica and just drop it in mm -hmm. because it's another city setting. It's another fantasy city setting. It's another fantasy city setting in D&D. &D. It's very, very portable. Sure. You can do the same thing with a lot of because of the kind of quasi modern nature of Eberron. You can grab stuff from places like the Iron Kingdoms mm -hmm. a little more easily than you could for, say, Greyhawk. Th those all work. Keep that sort of thing in mind, too, as you're going through this. It's like, you know, the the more similar the settings are, the more portable stuff is going to be, the less rough edges you're going to have to file off. Mm -hmm. And, of course, if you have NPCs, you can also borrow monsters and other enemies. Now, we talked about combat encounters, but even taking them out of the encounter and just saying, here's a bunch of stats and some the ways this monster fights or whatever, plopping that into your own game saves you a lot of trouble and if you can kind of blend it into the game that you've got going on, looks really cool. The other thing that's really nice is a lot of the time, monsters that are unique to a particular adventure are something that your players will have never seen before. Yeah. 
So you you have a nice way of avoiding the oh another troll problem. Mm-hmm. Obviously, like classic monsters like skeletons and dragons and trolls, you should have some of those in your setting because everybody wants to fight those. But if you find yourself running up against just yet another variant on elite orc troops, maybe go digging through some adventures and see what you can find. One of the things that I do kind of miss about the 3.5, 3.0 Pathfinder era of D&D style games being Ascendant mm-hmm. is there was a lot of material out there in really interesting ways in which it could be combined that wasn't just total broken nonsense from like the DM side, right? You could make like cloud giant lich with a draconic bloodline and make that like a a rogue cleric mix and have this really interesting strange villain Mm -hmm. paizo did a lot of interesting mixing and matching of that stuff in their adventure paths i think they still do actually it's just been a while since i bought one that was neat because it's like somebody has already done your homework for you but even without that kind of influence like you know we said there's a lot of the time if something is unique to an adventure it's just plain unique and it's not familiar. It's surprising, which is useful all on its own. One last thing on monsters and enemies. There are games that don't have great monster stats or opponent stats because most of the bad guys are basically other player characters. Right. And going through the whole character creation process or even just the bare minimum of it to come up with what you need for your antagonists can be really tedious and really painful. And very time-consuming. Yeah, exactly. Borrow those from a module, change the names you know, a few times. It's going to take your players a while to notice they're fighting the same stats. Trust me. As long as they look different and feel different, behave differently, the stats can be the same, especially if, as long as you're not using them back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back, right? Just have a, a few categorized in different ways and slap different names and behaviors and personalities on them. You'll be fine, but please save yourself the trouble. Just borrow somebody else's stats. It helps a lot. Yeah, I remember hearing on another podcast, I want to say maybe Sons of Cryos back in the day, one of the people was on and they were talking about a previous campaign. He was like, yeah, you guys fought a lot of skeletons. That was Chad from Fear the Boot. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay. I didn't call them skeletons. I called them all kinds of different things, but I really liked that stat block and you guys fought a lot of those. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Locations? Locations are good, uh, and not just necessarily in like a combat context, right? I mean, cool places like Rivendell or that fortress that, you know, that's built way up on that like natural stone arch or the tavern that's in the skull of a long dead gigantic dragon or pick something, you know, the, the, the neat hydroelectric plant that's kind of built into the waterfall that you have to fight a bunch of enemy spies through combat encounter or just visit to to see you know where the MacGuffin is any cool set piece right not just locations but locations do this particularly well any cool set piece just borrow it scrape the edges off hack it in you know hack it into your game boom done yeah to uh to use an example that didn't come from published game adventures right after the matrix came out back in like the late 90s early 2000s tons of gaming groups had their own version of that lobby fight scene Mm -hmm. This is not something you're ever going to hear me poo-poo. That was an awesome scene. Was. And if your group is into that, and they should be because it was an awesome scene, have fun. (laughs) Do it. You know, it's cool to do that sort of thing. Yeah. Plot lines as well. This this is trickier. Probably the trickiest of all of these because what you're really doing is taking an entire story and or claiming it as your own, right? If you read... Or do any uh, study of, you know, literary theory, you'll often come across the idea that there are only so many basic plots out there. We actually touched on this way back early in our um, episode. Yeah, talking about like the the various different types of plots that exist. Like somebody, some French guy had a, a book where he laid out like the 39 plots that exist and are the plot of every single story somewhere, that sort of thing. There, there are some people who say, oh, there's only seven types, you know, so on and so forth. However you break it down. Because if Given that that is a pretty common thought, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with it here. In fact, it, it may be right at some level. Having enough of the details in your adventure that you can make it kind of your own, but scraping off the outer edges and reframing it as a story you want to tell is a pretty good idea. Yeah. 
The other thing that's cool is that plot lines are often somewhat genre portable. So if you've got something, okay, let's say you're playing in just like a straight up historical Western style game, no supernatural elements or something. You're, you're playing Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday. You can still take like the overarching plot line of a lot of fantasy campaigns, strip all the fantasy tropes off of it, reskin it as a Western game, and it will make sense. Mm -hmm. The whole like roving group of formidable heroes wandering around solving problems in different parts of the world is surprisingly genre mobile. So take advantage of that and make stuff your own. I mean, this is literally what happened with Seven Samurai. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that movie's been remade so many different times. You know, there's The Magnificent Seven and... The Magnificent Seven, that's what I was thinking of. The Magnificent Seven is also an incredibly good movie, right? Mm -hmm. They're They're the same thing. But the genre changes everything about it. And it feels different, but at the same time, when you look at it, it is totally recognizable. You could easily have a cyberpunk Seven Samurai. In fact, oh yeah, and it'd be awesome. I say that, and then immediately thought, oh wait, that's on Netflix as an anime. So yeah, th that actually exists. Go for it. What's it called? Uh, Seven Samurai. Oh really? It's it's a it's basically Seven Samurai with giant robots and like some cyberpunk stuff. It's Weird. Huh. I'm not even necessarily saying it's good, but I watched a couple episodes. It was like, oh, yeah, it really is Seven Samurai. Huh. Huh. Neat. Interesting. Keep in mind that you can find, not just in the gaming shelves, by the way, books of just general plot lines and plot hooks out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Writer inspiration stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Look at look at like writing prompt threads on Reddit or in the writing section. Twitter. Uh, there, there are, yeah, there are a couple of books out there that I like. Eureka from Engine Publishing has a bunch of stuff that's specifically designed to be gaming plots, but it's usually just half a page at the most. It's usually just a few paragraphs like, hey, this sequence of events happens. Here's your idea. You know, you make it your own. Yep. I actually pulled the whole like get Melgar from Lestant to Magali Dabina thing out of Eureka. Right, there you go. And kind of along those lines, you can steal structural cues from adventures. And this is a little bit meta, but if you look at how adventures are constructed, and we talked about this last episode with Greg Stolze, balancing combat and mystery and social elements and character interaction and all that stuff, when, the, when do those happen and what's the, the rate at which those happen? What's the flow of the story? That sort of thing. I borrow those. Go for it. It's really good. Just broad strokes of what does a game look like? Steal those. Yeah. It, along the same lines, things like layout and organization, like we were talking about a little bit earlier with talking about PDFs of gaming books, that that can be handy to look at, too, because it can help you, like, set up your own GMing notes in such a way that where they flow nicely to you. And mm -hmm. It's easy to keep track of where stuff is. The other thing, too, is the broad strokes of concept way above, like, the actual plots can be useful here, too. So, like... The Kingmaker Adventure Path for Pathfinder can serve as a source of inspiration for a kingdom management campaign, even if you never go anywhere near Galarian or the Stolen Lands or you even crack those books. Just like the idea that at the beginning of this campaign, your player characters become landed nobility by cleaning bandits out of a land and then have to deal with problems that come up for a while. That's a, a really nice like story skeleton that you can hang whatever meat you want on. And that is that is valid, like yeah. taking even stuff at that super high level fantasy, but with some sci fi elements thrown in or espionage, but trying to deal with like ancient genies or something like that. Just take those high level concepts and then like, OK, I didn't have this idea before. Let's spread this out and see where it goes. Yeah. And at the most meta level, if you don't want to just lift from a published adventure, what you can do is examine what's unique about that adventure. And how it would differ from a session that you would run without any other input, right? Yeah. Basically, it's a, it's an insight into the author's style of GMing. Mm -hmm. And that and you have it written down. You don't have to like find them and, and play a con game with them or anything like that. You get how somebody wants to run a game and how they think an ideal session of your syst of the system you're playing would look written down for you. So look at that and then say, what do they think? is cool. What are they doing that's unique? Let me try and incorporate an element or two like that. Where do I agree or disagree with them? Yeah, like, oh, yeah, I see what they're doing differently. Let me try something 
like that. It works out. Or even just, I don't like this at all, but now this is crystallized in my brain and I can avoid it. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, that certainly has some value too, but I, I, I'm trying to be positive and this is more of a how do you take stuff out of an adventure, not how do you avoid stuff in adventures. Well, but you see, the thing is like, I don't think that it's necessarily like a wholly negative thing. You know, it's like if you if you look at something where it's like a combat plus a bunch of environmental hazards and think, I'm sure this is fun to play, but looking at this makes my head hurt. Then, you know, to kind of avoid that because you now it's all like spelled out in all of its, you know, crunchy detail and stuff. And it's like, yeah, I think maybe I'll just go with interesting terrain instead, you know? Yeah, OK, I mean, maybe not try and have them rolling on hallucination tables and dealing with like slick floors and that sort of thing while they're eh, they'll just maybe make it mountainous or have them fighting up and down staircases or something fair enough fair enough but i yeah one one thing that i actually wanted to do and this is you know we were talking we've kind of been getting more and more meta as we go here one thing i wanted to do in a game uh in the colony game actually was jam an entire adventure into it a whole published module because just because an adventure comes with a story wrapped around it doesn't mean you can't scrape that story off, wash your hands, and insert it into your own ongoing game, right? This doesn't have to stand alone at all. Right. In the Colony game, what I wanted to do was run you guys through at least one published adventure as an in-world myth told to you by NPCs. Yeah, and I'm really kind of sad we never got to do that. <laughs> Me too. I really am. Maybe we'll do it as like a Christmas special or something one year. Who knows? Yeah. But what I was going to do is I was going to pre-generate characters or just and just be like, hey, if you guys wanted, what would you play in a different colony game? Right. Like what class are you interested in trying out? Because that would give players a chance to try a different character class or archetype or whatever without feeling like you're ruining the existing group of characters by switching characters on everyone. Right. Right. Because especially the way our group plays, we have these tight relationships between characters. And if we suddenly have one character go away and another one come in. It really just destroys those relationships. Yeah, you can hear the record scratch and then perhaps breaking glass and pots and pans going down a flight of yeah, stairs in the background. Yeah, the whole it's game not ending. good. Yeah. But yeah. this way, it's like, oh, no, this is a frame story. It's cool. These are disconnected from our actual characters. So, yeah, we'll we'll mix it up and try something new. It's cool. Right? Yeah. Hey, I get to play a fighter. And the other thing is, maybe this is <laughs> me uh, having played a lot of Skyrim here lately. You know the archetypal scene where an NPC dryly relates ancient legends that are 100% true and you need to know them? Mm -hmm. It's real boring. Mm -hmm. It's the info dump. Yep. <laughs> Wouldn't it be much more engaging if players play through the ancient legend and discover the relevant clues in their own way? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it would be. <laughs> so do that, right? Also, because your, prim your primary game world is a frame story in this case... The story within a story adventure can be as fantastic or as realistic as you want. If this is a myth that's being told, yeah, make it nonsensical. I was going to run White Plume Mountain, which is full of like floating, you know, rivers floating through the air and just utter nonsense, right? Yeah. And that's fine because it's a weird high fantasy myth. Right. Oh, yeah. This is clearly a mystical made up place, whatever. But there's some element of truth in that story that re is reflected in the real world, the game world that your main characters are actually in. And so that was the idea, right? It's going to flavor that sub story and setting, put some relevant information in there. So it wasn't disconnected, just not a, a it wasn't a story about your characters. That was the idea. It was interesting backstory and we got a chance to try a different style of play. The, the other thing that's nice about this sort of thing, just to, to kind of buttress what you're saying, you can play around with stuff that's like at a vastly different power level from your default party, too. Sure. If you want to try on Odysseus for a while, roll up them 15th level characters, even if your base party is only level three. Yeah, and it's not that different from the flashback or the flash forward or the we cut away to something happening somewhere else with other NPCs, right? Right. You know, the classic, we start the scene over here, kind of the, the prologue, like we start the, the movie over here it, you know, and some disaster is starting and one guy gets away to carry news of it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you can play that out 
it's cool. But in this, you know, it's it's the same thing. We're cutting away and telling a different story. So maybe you've got a a cyberpunk module. I can hear the story of how this adventure went down from someone else, and then we say, "All right, he's going to tell you the story." Cut to us playing this adventure, this Shadowrun module or whatever, and then we at the end cut back to this guy saying, "And that's how it happened." And here's the the fallout that affects you, and here's the item, right? And maybe you get one of the treasures from that. Uh, module in the real world because this NPC who's telling it to you, he lived through it, he's got it and he's giving it to you, right? And that you sort of get yeah. a reward for the the main story, you know, in there. Go take this thing and stick it to that megacorp. <laughs> you can do this sort of stuff. And I think it's a fun way to steal these adventures. Just scrape everything off and fit it into your setting. I, yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, this is very much what Rogue One is to episode four of star wars you're right it works it's a fun way to steal an adventure and it it's a way to say all right we're going to do this we're going to make it kind of a, a thing but we're not stopping the game for it also you get to gm in character which is a lot of fun yeah that's cool ultimately it's somebody telling this story so you could do it normally but i think you should absolutely gm in character and have fun with it Make an interesting NPC, have them be the person telling the story, do funny voices throughout, have a blast. Absolutely. A few other bits of random advice here. Mix and match. You don't have to steal from one thing at a time. In fact, it's probably better if you don't. Players might recognize individual elements, but eh, as long as everybody's having fun. Yeah, exactly. Keep an eye out for resources that'll help you do what you want in the system that you're running in as you're porting things from system to system. So I I keep going back to this Kingmaker thing because I've been playing the video game based on it. But if let's say that you want to do the Kingmaker adventure path, but your group like ours really prefers 5e D&D to Pathfinder because it's lower friction and there's less to keep track of. Obviously, it's not real easy to directly convert material from Pathfinder to 5e. They use totally different sets of math. It's Mm. it's crazy. And there's not a lot of kingdom management stuff in 5e, except for now there is. Matthew Coville's been working on a book that's for, like, strongholds and followers, and you can probably grab some information out of that and use that to translate the other adventure path into the system that you're doing. Also, the Birthright fan conversion is all about that. Yes, yeah. Birthright in general is really good for ideas for kingdom management, Mm -hmm. because that's that game's whole thing, if I understand correctly. And there's a spinoff of Rain that is system agnostic and is all about organization and kingdom management that sits on top of any game. So, yeah, there are resources out there. System agnostic resources in general are just kind of your friend for gluing stuff from disparate sources together. Yeah, because they help you think along the lines of how to model stuff in your game. You know, it's like if you've got something that's purely descriptive, it helps you kind of like boil other stuff down to that descriptive essence and then build it back up again is what you need it to be. Now, as for resources to do this with, you know, if you're looking to just borrow from something because you got a game this next week and I I don't have anything prepped. I need to, to borrow something to, to save myself some time. All right, look, first of all, if there's a particular module or campaign that you're interested in borrowing from, buy it and borrow from it, right? Simple enough. Yeah. If you're just looking to build up a collection of stuff, bundles are great. Bundle of Holding is out there. Drive Through RPG does charity bundles for like major disasters and stuff like that. Those tend to be great. And hey, the money's going to charity too. So that's, you know, double bonus. Humble bundles are good for this. They've done a bunch of tabletop RPG stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There are also books of encounters out there and these are often self-published things, you know, uh, drive through RPG, DMs Guild, whatever. Uh, you know, for example, in fourth edition, I actually have this. There's a dungeon delve book, D and D fourth edition. Wizards put it out, and it's just sequences of three to four connected combat encounters, so like a mini module, as it were, for every level from one to thirty. Right, so there's thirty of these connected combat encounters, and they're pretty well done. There's terrain features, opportunities for skill use in the combat, so you're not just I run up and use my axe. I use my daily power. That sort of thing, right? It's, oh, well, I go over here. I use my athletic skill to set something up, do something cool, right? Or he gets so much unjustified shade thrown in it. They really tried to do some cool stuff with that edition. Totally understand because I agree that it doesn't always feel like Dungeons and Dragons, but 
Yeah. If you set aside the I would like this to feel like D&D part of it, it's fun. I enjoyed it. I am not always up for incredibly tedious combats because at high levels it takes forever. There is that is a real problem. Just on a pure design level or the kind of products that they came up with, there was there was some good stuff. Absolutely. In that era. Aside from books of encounters, there are books of whole adventures, tales from the yawning portal, like any collections of adventures. GURPS, I'm sure, has these. GURPS, and then I have like square brackets genre <laughs> adventures. They did them for supers, cyberpunk, fantasy, martial arts, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah, and that's just off the top of my head. So there's a six pack of scenarios for unknown armies out there, right? Yeah, like g- just grab these; they're great, and they're usually pretty discounted if you get them in PDF form, right? Yeah, so go with it. Now, as for free modules, one of your best resources is actually Free RPG Day, because major publishers and a lot of mo- small publishers put out little modules to run new players through and people who've never played an RPG before. And those are really creative often and very fun. Yeah, because they're intended to be for your first contact with whatever thing they're hoping to sell you after you play this. They are often low level, but you can scale them up. They're a good starter point. Get them a go. They're they're free. They're usually available on the web, uh, you know, your publisher's website. Just get them. They're really fun. Yeah, or swing by the gaming store and snag them there. If you Absolutely. Can. Especially be like, hey, after free RPG day, do you have any leftover? I'll take one. Right. Organized play stuff. This is another good resource because usually organized play modules can be found free or cheap, especially after that season has ended or, you know, even as they're released because the they're not making money off the module. They're making money off the organized play of people sitting down to play the game or sometimes even just we have an invested audience of people who are buying into our game system our stuff because they get to play it regularly yeah you know those are often just published for free and available and because they tend to scale up with characters you have a broader range of uh, power available in those modules so that works out now mm-hmm. obviously not every game company has organized play for their games so these this is usually limited to the major publishers frankly paizo and wizards of the coast yeah, it's really limited to the big two. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's probably others that I don't know about, but those are the ones that come to mind. But again, if you're playing those, they are the most popular for a reason. Odds are you are also playing them. Grab those. They're good resources. Yeah, basically, don't don't just look at those, you know, things and be like, hey, I can't use this and shove it on a shelf. You know, there's there's a lot that you can take out of published adventures even if you have no intention of ever running it as written you know what they are really cheap online they really are i grabbed a couple (laughs) i grabbed a couple to send to the system mastery podcast because they had talked about doing reviews of weird and crazy and bad modules and yeah oh there you go i did not pay much i've got i bought them through drive through rpg because being respectful of the original uh, authors, you know, make sure to pay for them. I'm not like looking for, you know, stray PDFs online or anything. Grabbed them and sent it to them. And it did not set me back much. And honestly, I kind of want to go back to one of them and steal for my own game because it was an absolutely nonsensical, like second edition D&D module. Uh, it's the one that um, Fear of the Boot used to make fun of for a while. Earthshaker. Oh, yeah. Okay. Apparently, this, the kind of overall setting that that came from was notoriously weird. A weird second edition setting, you say? <laughs> it was like notoriously weird for second edition. And considering that was the edition that gave us the weird but good Planescape, the weird but good Dark Sun, and the weird but good um, Spelljammer? Yeah, communist gnomes driving a colossus in a circus. Like, it's weird. Yeah. But- I kind of want to go back and be like, man, is there anything I can borrow from this? Sure, it's second edition, but I'm not borrowing stats. I'm just borrowing like NPCs and relationships and characters. Cool. Let me let me get that. Yeah. Right. The other one was Palladium. So, you know, no stealing from that. But still, uh, um, uh. <laughs> it, it just seems like a lot of fun. These are not terribly expensive. And we all probably have a buddy who's got a gaming library. They've probably picked up modules in the past. Ask to read through them. See if you can borrow them and just find stuff you like. It's great. It's good stuff. People have done this work for you. Don't let it go to waste. Yeah, absolutely. Peter, 
thanks for taking some time here just after Christmas to, to record with me. This has, I think, been a good episode so far. Yeah, this one was actually light enough to really be kind of fun to do, so no problem. Absolutely. Um, I don't – we're going to keep streaming. Um, our next episode is probably going to be a bonus episode talking about uh, objectives and key results for our podcast going forward. We're not going to do this every quarter, obviously, because that would – we only have like 26 episodes that we release a year. We don't want to spend four of them kind of laying it out because I think the process of laying out objectives and key results would be interesting for listeners to hear about as kind of a self-improvement kind of thing because I'm talking about it in kind of a, a corporate organization kind of term here, but this works pretty well for just individual planning or family planning, that sort of thing. So good thing to have in your back pocket. And of course, it's going to be gaming related and podcast related and convention related Absolutely. because that's what we're trying to reach out to. It's not going to be completely outside of what what we do on our our show yeah. we promise not to give you a business book in podcast form <laughs> i promise we'll be talking about like planning to go to conventions and running games and all this other stuff so yeah good stuff yeah all right well everybody who's tuned in we really appreciate it if you want to hear previous episodes go to stgcast.org or saving the game podcast.org uh and from our website you can join our discord channel which is full of awesome listeners and I would love it if you joined and started talking. It's a really nice group of people, and you should meet them. <laughs> really is. We've been having a lot of fun chatting over the, the Christmas break. If you like this episode or any of our past episodes, please make sure to share them on social media. You know, tag us in it if you want. You don't have to, but just let people know about us. That helps us a ton. So please make sure to yeah. do that. And from all of us here at Saving the Game, have a good one. Take it easy. We'll catch you next time. See you later, folks. This has been a production of Saving the Game. All episodes are produced and published under a Creative Commons 4.0 attribution, share-alike license. Our logo is by Ruben Smith Zimple of 3d6design.com. Our music is The Promised Place Beyond the Clouds by James Opie. You can find more of his music at nihilor.com. To hear our past episodes, to find syndication and license details, to connect with our fantastic listener community, or to contact us or support our show through Patreon, visit our website at stgcast.org or savingthegamepodcast.org. God bless, do good, and happy gaming.